Hello, it's Jimmy here, uh, and I'm outside in York because it's a nice crisp winter's evening and I thought, well, minus three is the perfect temperature to come out and stand for 15 minutes on a semi-frozen race course. But it's a lovely evening, look at this nice sky we've got. This lovely sort of slightly misty evening light. So I thought I'd come out and enjoy a little bit of the crisp cold winter weather. I'm a winter person, not a summer person. It's why I do Viking reenactment. But today we're talking about hygiene and hygiene and cold actually go together. In the 20th century there was a theory that uh, keeping hospital wards cold would help to prevent the spread of infection and that sort of thing. Uh, some people feel that if you're in a, a warm, slightly more humid climate you're more likely to get sick than if you're in a cold, dry, crisp climate. And that theory still prevails in many places and with many people today. But in the Viking Age, hygiene was a very different matter. So before we even start talking about what Viking Age people did for personal hygiene and general hygiene, we have to deal with one thing, and that is the fact that germ theory did not exist in the Viking Age. So the idea that there were bacteria and microbes and microorganisms and viruses that spread infections uh, through at attacking people's immune systems and various organs and that sort of thing, not a thing. Um, yes, there were classical theories that said that there were tiny little things that floated around in the air and, and did stuff, but actual germ theory, as we know it in modern medicine, not a thing. So people are washing their hands, people are washing their faces. They're not doing that because they need to get rid of the bacteria on them. This isn't, this isn't epidemiology. They're doing it for other reasons. <clears throat> One of the reasons that they're probably doing it, if it's not for germ theory, is because it's a religious thing. Maybe it is ritual purification and culturally acceptable sort of purifying yourself before you do things like going to the all thing. If you live in Old Norse Scandinavia or Old Norse uh, dominated countries like the Isle of Man, maybe you, you wash your face and you comb your hair and beard and you eat a meal before you go to the all thing because that's what is expected of you. That's actually mentioned in some of the sagas. Which saga is it now? Can't remember. Editing Jimmy will put it up here because he's clever. Um, but people are washing in the Viking Age. They're washing, they're cleaning, they're looking after their bodies, they're doing their best to look their best. And we know this from lots of different places. We have later sources that talk about Viking Age hygiene. We have archaeological sources that talk about, that tell us about Viking Age hygiene. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at both what we've got written down and what we've found that tells us about it. So what can we learn from the source material? What source material do we have? We have a couple of sources that mention Viking Age hygiene. Famously, uh, the Arab traveller Ibn Fadlan talks about Viking Age hygiene amongst the Rus. And that's a helicopter. I don't know how audible it is, but there's a helicopter, and helicopters are cool so we can stay in. Uh, he is talking about the Rus here, he's talking about people living on the Volga River. These are not contemporary Scandinavians, these are the Rus. Yes, they're descended from mostly Swedish, um, Norse people, traders and raiders and settlers. But by the point that even Fadlan is visiting them, they are culturally distinct. He mentions things like uh, communal face washing and hand washing using the same shared bowl. This is where we get the kind of uh, semi-myth that the Vikings all shared the same bowls and baths when they, when they washed and the whole family would use the same water to conserve water. It's just probably a bit of an exaggeration and it's related to a funeral ritual, so we're not quite sure if that's a thing that we can use reliably. The other big source that we get that people will probably comment on this video citing or misciting, because it happens all the time whenever I say Vikings and bathing, people say an Anglo-Saxon bishop wrote to his friend that the Vikings stole all of their women because they bathed. What that actually is, is John of Wallingford. And he's not an Anglo-Saxon, and he's certainly not a bishop. He wished. John of Wallingford is a 13th century English infirmarer. And an infirmarer is in charge of the infirmary in a monastery or in an abbey. And he was at the Abbey of St. Albans in the 13th century. So he is a high medieval English monk. He's not a bishop, he's not an Anglo-Saxon, we don't really call them the Anglo-Saxons after William the Conqueror 
effectively commits genocide against the noble population of the English after 1066. He basically wipes out the majority of Anglo-Saxon nobles at Hastings and thereafter uh, they are replaced by French, Norman French nobles. So the language of court is French for centuries in England. He's definitely not an Anglo-Saxon anymore. And basically what he does is he writes a history, he writes a chronicle of England a lot of it's exaggerated, a lot of it is wrong. When even the Victorians are saying that it's exaggerated and worthless, you know that you are making too much stuff up. But he does have some interesting bits and bobs. He mentions the St. Bryce's Day Massacre in 1002, which happens under King Ethelred the Unready. And before that bit, he has a little preamble. He says the Danes had the habit of bathing every Saturday, combing their hair daily, and changing their clothes frequently, which basically allowed them to seduce married women and convince women to be their mistresses. Definitely not a contemporary complaining that the Danes are stealing their, stealing their women. Definitely an English monk 200 years later writing a weird history claiming that the Danes had the habit of washing every Saturday, bathing every Saturday, combing their hair daily and changing their clothes regularly. That's it. That's all we got. That's where all of this comes from. That's where all of these websites that say things like the Vikings were cleaner than you. Now if that seems like shaky ground to you, then I absolutely agree. It seems like shaky ass ground. It seems like the thinnest of ice. Even thinner than the ice that's on the race course over there. So we're not going to put too much store by that, but it's the source that we've got. What does that suggest? It suggests that the Anglo-Saxons in the 11th century were not bathing every Saturday, which is entirely possible. It's possible that they didn't submerge themselves in water very much, that the prevailing theory under the Anglo-Saxons was that submerging yourself in water was unhealthy. That has been a thing, that has been a theory. In the 17th century, it was, it was believed that if you submerged yourself in water too often, it would imbalance your humours and you would become unhealthy by bathing too much. Did they bathe every Saturday? Potentially. Like, bathing seems to have been a thing that they did. We have some later evidence and some slight archaeological evidence that Old Norse people in the Viking Age in Iceland were using hot springs to bathe. Snorri Sturluson, he of the sagas, is said to have built his own hot tub, basically a stone-lined hot spring in Iceland with a secret tunnel that led to his farmhouse so that he could womble down in the freezing cold and take a nice hot dip. Sounds fantastic. I mean, imagine that would be great. A little hot tub just here, right there. Nice. In fact, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll demolish the grandstand for the race course and we'll build a nice Viking hot tub right there. Jorvik Viking Centre, give me a call. I've got a plan for your next museum site. So we've got these mentions of bathing and they're very very you know they're, they're, they're slight they're marginal we do also have a treaty between the byzantine empire and the rus in 907 which i've been told contains a, basically a subclause that states that varangians barangioi so barbarian mercenaries and traders that they're not just warriors they are also merchants there is a, a varangian merchant area quarter in byzantium in uh, what, what is now Istanbul at the time, in the 10th century, so they are not just warriors. The Varangians are a group of people, they are an ethnicity of people living in the city. And they are to enter the city in groups of no more than 50, uh, in case they start fighting with each other and others, under the protection, under escort, by the Imperial Guard. Hammer of the Emperor! And obviously, Cadia stands, so that's something that they could do. But it does also apparently say that the Varangians are allowed to use the bathhouses as much as they like. They get unrestricted access to the baths, which is lovely. So, they are bathing. They're interested in bathing. They want to bathe. Um, the Old Norse seem to be pretty hot on bathing from the contemporary and later sources that we have. And that is, as far as I'm aware, the only contemporary source that mentions them using, using bathhouses. So, what does the archaeology tell us? The archaeology tells us that Old Norse people were super into personal hygiene and personal grooming. Now, most Viking reenactors that you see have forgotten that combs exist. However, combs are one of the cultural identifiers that tells us we're dealing with an Old Norse or an Anglo-Saxon um, 
influenced site because antler combs with certain types of decoration like the ring and dot are incredibly common on Viking Age sites. Pretty much every inhabited site we have from Viking Age Europe you'll find a comb or two. And these combs are beautifully made, they're quite complex some of them. Uh, there are combs with cases that the comb slots into, there are combs that have little pegs that stop the comb coming out of the case. They're made from slats of antler cut from antlers and they're sawn through using saws or wires and they're absolutely some of them are beautiful beautiful little pieces of art they're used for combing hair hair grows on heads hair grows on chins some of these have been found in men's graves some of them have been found in women's graves they've been found in other places we find loads of combs people were combing their hair on their heads and on their chins. It's, it's, it's very obvious from the sheer volume of them. They've got about 50 just in Jorvik Viking Center down the road. You've, you've, we've got literally thousands of antler and bone and ivory combs and horn. So they were brushing their hair. What else were they doing? Let's go from the feet up, shall we? Why not? Or we go from the head down. Let's go from the head down. So they're brushing their hair. Are they brushing their teeth? We found no toothbrushes, but we have found evidence of toothpicking. We have these hygiene sets, we call them. Hygiene kits that come basically with, you'll get a set of tweezers. Tweezers, obviously, you can do all sorts with. You can grab a blackhead and pop it with the pin if you want. You can pluck your eyebrows. You can pluck ingrowing hairs. You can do whatever you want with tweezers. Tweezers are fantastic. Uh, you know, you can put stamps in your stamp collecting album with tweezers. Mwah. Um, one of the other things we find on these hygiene sets is pricks or prickers or, or little, little sort of needles, pins, suspended from a ring, usually, if they're in a set. And... These can be used for all sorts of things as well, of course. They can be used for cleaning under your fingernails, cleaning your toenails, and also for toothpicking. And we have teeth from eastern Sweden, which have evidence of picking in the teeth. And Viking Age teeth aren't the best teeth in the world. They're not bad. They don't have a high processed sugar content in their diets, but they, they did have a tendency to... to well... They, they pick their teeth and they have very, very roughly ground flour using quern stones, so a lot of their teeth have some, some dental attrition. Some of, the, some of the teeth that we found have caries down to the pulp and you see them artificially widening teeth with, with little knives and gouges to try and stop the pain. And of course it makes the pain worse and that leads to gum and jaw infections. You start losing teeth and in the worst cases you die. So they did have bad teeth back then. Not everybody, but bad teeth were known. The tooth picking evidence is basically little worn circles in between the teeth where they've been gnashing away at them with, with these metal toothpicks, all metal and bone and ivory toothpicks. So moving downwards, what else have we got? Armpits, washing, general washing probably did take place. If you start to smell, you wash. That doesn't take a PhD. You know, if you start stinking, you start washing yourself. So they were probably washing with rags, again, with the hot springs and the bathing. We think that bathing was a thing that was done relatively regularly. Uh, fingernails and toenails. No evidence of toenail clippers or anything like that. They probably were biting their nails. I know a few people who bite their nails today. They did have the technology for scissors and clippers and nippers and that sort of thing. So they were probably using them and knives. In terms of shaving, Beards were in fashion, but we have found things that we think were razors. Um, but it's difficult to know if it's a razor for shaving your beard off, or if it's just a knife for general tool use. It's, it's hard to say without specific evidence. Interestingly, on the teeth front, some of the teeth from eastern Sweden have been filed at the front. And one of the theories is that that is a dental procedure that's not a decorative thing that is to try and stop pain in the teeth i'm going to mention it again i did do a video about the teeth thing as far as we can tell it's not a warrior cult thing and there's no evidence that any of the pigments available at the time would actually stick in the teeth so just forget about that going further down again the bum area so obviously people have to poop and after they poop they have to clean the area up we know that there are societies and have been societies that have used all sorts of different things toilet paper's only been around for like 120 years so what were the vikings using they were probably using organic matter so nice soft mosses leaves and grass that kind of stuff we haven't got much direct evidence from the poop pits because that all rots down very very quickly once it is under the ground and it's compacted together but 
we've got lots of suggestions of organics in their poo pits, in their latrines, so probably stuff like moss, as you might have already imagined, was being used for toilet paper. In terms of feminine hygiene, menstruation and that kind of stuff, a couple of people have already asked me, how did people menstruate historically? And I basically say, the same way they do now, it's an organic process that hasn't really changed a lot in the last thousand years, believe it or not. Um, Abby Cox has done a fantastic video on this, so I would advise you to go and watch Abby's video on this. It's absolutely fantastic, she's done all of the legwork and research. I'm not even going to say anything more, I'm just going to say, go and watch Abby Cox's video on historical menstruation. It's really, 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 really good, and it clears up a lot of the questions that people have quite regularly on the subject. So, continuing down the body, your feet are pretty manky um, places, even modernly. I've been to the gym today, and I had to take a shower because my feet were absolutely honking. A thousand years ago, again, if your feet absolutely reeked, give them a wash in it. It's not hard. But, if there was no real obvious smell or evidence of fouling, you didn't need to wash your feet, right? I mean, everybody was walking around in muddy fields wearing turn shoes, so slightly dirty, stinky feet were probably a thing. In fact, everybody definitely smelt worse than we do today because they didn't industrially wash their clothes every couple of days. It just wasn't a concept. The idea that you would wash your clothes, change your clothes twice a day, is probably alien to the to the mind of your average Viking Age farmer. Like, I've only got two tunics, why would I change them that rapidly? It takes like three hours to properly wash them and then overnight to dry them if I'm lucky. So you've got to bear that in mind as well. In terms of changing clothes, they were probably doing that less frequently than is culturally acceptable in most places today. But then again, environmentally, we should be washing our clothes less, and we should be changing our clothing less, and we should certainly be buying clothing a lot less frequently. So, probably a little stinky by our standards, but it's just the smell of the human animal. That sounds really gross. So, the Vikings had personal hygiene, they had bathing as far as we can tell, obviously take the later sources with a small pinch of salt because we don't know what their agendas were when they wrote those sources, but they were picking their teeth with toothpicks. They were plucking their eyebrows and beards with tweezers. They were combing their hair and beards. They were probably wearing perfume. One of our other sources says that in 10th century Hedeby in Denmark, they were also wearing black eye makeup as decoration, not for sun glare protection. Don't come at me with the sun glare. It's a load of horse cack. But they were wearing it to beautify themselves, according to the sources. So the Vikings were almost certainly bathing regularly, they were combing their hair, they were picking their teeth, they were washing their hands and faces before going to important meetings, but they didn't have germ theory. So at the end of the day, if your hands didn't look like they were covered in filth, you might not wash them before, well, anything, before picking at your teeth and trying to get rid of the bits of stone ground flour stuck between them. You might not wash your hands before eating, you might not wash your hands before you know, other stuff that you like to be hygienic for. So, were the Vikings cleaner than us? No, absolutely not. They didn't have germ theory and they didn't have toothbrushes or dental floss, so their teeth were worse than mine. I've actually got really good teeth, they're just yellowing because I drink a load of tea, and I'm not vain, so I'm not bleaching them. But I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm going back in because the temperature has now dropped a little bit, it is now minus six, and I am getting a little bit chilly. So, thank you ever so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this. If you would like to subscribe, please do. If you want to get a notification when my videos come out, then click on the belly thing. And if you want to support the channel financially, like my wonderful, wonderful patrons, then the patron link and the coffee link are down in the description. Thank you very much indeed for joining. And till the next time, Tanatronissa, Ulvaur, bye bye.
I'm going to walk off into the sunset now. Ta-da! Bloody freezing, man. <laughs>